Welcome to the TCS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week, we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe, offering exclusive insights, inspiration, and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. Hello, my name is Shalai Tambo, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. I'm a lecturer in early childhood studies at Bath Spa University and an associate lecturer at the Open University. I'm a trustee for the Fathered Institute and also an independent writer and speaker for Critical Early Years. Now, throughout this series, we'll be exploring representation in the early years, inspiring you with guidance on ways to be more inclusive in your practice. And I am delighted to introduce Kerry Murphy as today's guest. In this episode, we'll be discussing ableism in play. So to start off, Kerry, please could you explain what ableism is? Yes, of course. So ableism in its most simplest terms is the favouring of um, typical minds and non-disabled bodies. Um, ableism, again, it's another thing that's being increasingly discussed in early childhood and ableism is a systemic issue within our society. But what's really, really important to highlight is that ableism is a system, this idea that there is a right way to be and actually to be able-bodied is to be superior or to have a typically developing mind is to be superior. It is actually very much intrinsically linked to other isms. Um, and there is a black abolitionist called Talila A. Lewis. She is a um, disability activist in America. And she has provided a working definition of ableism, which is a bit more kind of loaded, but really important to recognize that ableism does not sit on its own. It is connected to a very kind of harmful history and its origins are in anti-blackness, racism, eugenics, uh, colonialism, imperialism. And it is this idea that there is a right way to be, there is the ideal kind of human, and that's what we should all be aspiring to be. There are a lot of conversations around at the moment that you can't really discuss ableism, particularly in education, without talking about racism and anti-blackness and also intersectionality. So thinking about how our different identity markers impact our educational experiences and ableism, the reason it's important in an early education perspective is because we begin from children's earliest years to kind of set this standard for what is the right way to be. You know, in the previous ep episode where we talked about our curriculums and frameworks, one of my kind of biggest arguments is they are inherently ableist. They put to you that there is an ideal way to be, there is an ideal learner, there is a good level of development. We should all be seeking to achieve the, the, the same state of being. We should all fit in to these socially constructed ideas of normalcy. And it's really harmful. When I speak to educators about this, they obviously get very like, whoa, okay, you know, <laughs> where do I even begin then to overthrow this? And obviously, uh, systemic issues can't just be overthrown overnight. And so the thing that I often speak to educators about is about disabledism. And disabledism, it's a concept written by about by Dan Goodley, who is an amazing disability scholar. And he talks in his work around disabledism almost being like the action of ableism. So it's where we uphold that wider system. So it's the things that we do every day within our practice. And so I often say to educators, if you're wanting to address ableism, you need to think about how are you as an individual upholding that in your everyday early childhood practices. Um, and that does require an interrogation of your practices, which can be difficult. Um, but the only way to, it's one of those, once you see it, you can't unsee it and you go, oh, actually, I can see where that is really harmful and where it favours one particular way of being. Mm. It's difficult to understate the, the importance of ableism as a, as a concept that, that, that frames our life effectively in, in a number of different ways, but particularly in educational systems and, and the early years. Again, you say that it's uh, enforced to some extent by the curriculum models that we have in practice, but there's also a real need for practitioners to engage in that critical reflection. Perhaps unknowingly, uh, practitioners may be uh, 
perpetuating ableism in their practice on a daily basis. Could you give some practical examples on a, on a daily basis of how practitioners might be doing this, perpetuating ableism without perhaps knowing? Yeah, so some of the key examples that I talk about is um, one of the things is the idea of how we pay attention and how we listen and how we engage. So what's been very popular within early years in education over this over the years is this idea of whole body listening, that in order to prove that we are paying attention and um, that we need to sit still, we need to not fidget, we need to be able to have listening ears, we need to do good looking. You know, we have all these kind of arbitrary rules that to prove that you are listening to me you need to listen and engage in this way and actually what then happens is that becomes really exclusionary to a lot of neurodivergent profiles so for example autistic children who might engage in self-stimulatory behaviors uh, such as kind of hand spinning or rocking um, or fidgeting children with emergent ADHD traits. So, for example, um, they like might move to focus. Their way of paying attention is actually liking to move. So I myself am ADHD, and you know that I'm paying attention more if I'm actually moving. But actually in school, I was constantly told, sit still, sit straight, face the front, and actually, that was really, really confining. Um, eye contact. So we still, even today, see goals that focus on eye contact for autistic children. This idea that in order to show that you are communicating effectively, you must give eye contact. Whereas autistic people notoriously find it uncomfortable, will often drop eye contact because they are engaged in auditory processing. So culturally and developmentally, it's not required to prove that you're paying attention. So that's like kind of one of the big ones that are seen. Play. Um, so obviously this is my doctorate area, so the pathologization of play. So this idea that play doesn't come naturally to neurodivergent and disabled children. And we use play as a way of confirming that they are incompetent or inadequate or failing. And um, so, for example, oh, all that child does is line things up. They must be autistic as though that that's a problem. Yet, if we saw a neurotypical child lining things up, we would label that as a schema and go, wow, let's plan for that lining up. So we often see play kind of co-opted and abducted from children. And those children often then find themselves in intervention programs where they're being taught how to play. And the reality is they're being taught how to play neurotypically, uh, which can lead to a real serious issue known as masking, where the child kind of recognises the way I am and who I am is not accepted, so I need to behave in a particular way. The other big thing that dominates our early years is social skills, this idea that... In interactions, it's the neurodivergent child that is failing in those interactions. It's referred to as the double empathy problem, that during your interactions with another, rather than the neurotypical also failing in that communication, the blame is placed onto the neurodivergent individual. Rather than recognising, actually, there's just a mismatch in both people's communication, and we need to understand each other's communication in order to create more attunement to each other. Um, and again, what children then find themselves in is social skills training, where they are taught how to act in socially appropriate ways without any kind of recognition that they have their own ways of being social. And that's, you know, that's equally valid. Just coming back to the play one as well, one of the big things that's pathologized is solitary and parallel play. Yet for a lot of particularly autistic children, they spend longer periods of time engaged in solitary and parallel play before they will enter cooperative. Um, and that's often seen as, whoa, that's a real problem that the child likes to play on their own for a sustained period of time. But what we know about autistic children and adults now is that they have what is known as a monotropic attention tunnel, uh, meaning that they can really engage in a sustained way in a particular activity or experience that brings them pleasure and joy. Um, and we often, speech and language therapists will refer to it as something called sabotage. So they will say sabotage the child's play in order to redirect them for an adult kind of outcome, um, which again is ableist because you are kind of non-affirming of that child's way of being. So yeah, sorry, I gave lots of rambled examples. No, no, but... okay. I'm sure that listeners will be really enjoying just listening to you unpack the ways in which ableism emerges in a number of different ways. I think we 
saying there about how children are taught to pay attention in, in particular ways and most certain forms of social skills training, They're effectively forms of policing, aren't they, children from a, from a really early age. I think it reminds me of Paulo Freire and what he says about education being either for domestication or, or freedom. And so often we domesticate children into these particular ways of, of being and becoming. I just want to go back to, to language and labelling, though, um, and the ways that practitioners might unwittingly be too quick to perhaps label children um, with particular traits um, and, and the implications of that for, for children in their early years, really. Yeah. So even that point there, even that kind of subtle shift that you've used in your language to refer to a trait rather than a symptom, mm-hmm. um, and it's something that we find really commonly within early childhood. And, and again, I think the term pathologization can often kind of intimidate practitioners, but it's this idea of kind of like medicalizing language when it comes to children who are different. And so, for example, we may see them engaging in particular types of play, or the way they engage with the world around them. And we will say, oh, that's a symptom of their way of being rather than actually it's a trait. Um, Or we'll immediately jump to saying delay or red flag. I recently saw a speech and language therapist introduce alarm bells for development. And it's, as I said earlier on, once you start to speak about the child in terms of being a problem, then they do indeed become a problem. You're kind of almost making your job harder by only viewing that child through this very kind of narrow lens. Um, And language, I think we have to be really careful with language because I think there can sometimes be a little bit of policing of language. And I don't think that that always helps to correct everything everybody says, because then that can put you off actually experimenting with different ways of talking about children. But I do think we need to expand the parameters of how we speak about children. And I think we need to develop more holistic descriptions of children who are neurodivergent so rather than just talking about them on their worst days rather than just talking about them in terms of their sums of deficits and concerns actually talking about their interests their traits their differences and um, and indeed their needs and I think actually developing a more holistic description of those children is is really really important And also, earlier on, when I was speaking about neurodiversity, the kind of dream is, is that neurodiversity is viewed through a neutral lens in the, in the sense of you are, you're just autistic, you know, we're not going to say you've got a superpower because you're autistic or that you are an impaired individual, you are just autistic. And I think that neutrality is really, really important because I think we can go the other way. We can sometimes be a little bit, um, We can have a bit of toxic positivity around only focusing on the strengths. Actually, humans are complex and messy. All humans have strengths, differences and needs. And it's about affording the same holistic descriptions to neurodivergent children as we would for neurotypical children. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just just thinking about what you said about those alarm bells for development, which it's kind of shocking to hear that. Those sorts of things do happen um, in, in practice today, but, but hopefully not on, on the most part. So think- and just to jump in there, sorry, yeah. Shadai, but yeah, okay. I don't want to miss it out. The thing that I always say to educators around some of this red flag observation checkpoint alarm bell language is one of the biggest um, issues that educators report is parental engagement and finding collaboration with, with families. Um, and I always say, how engaged would you be if the first conversation that you had about a child's development was, I've noticed red flags in your child's development, which in, which signifies danger or an alarm bell? You're not, as a parent, going to go, wow, okay, let's have a conversation. Your defences are going to go up because you're going to feel, are you suggesting that I am the creator of those red flags? Have I caused those issues? And so, again, the language we use also translates to our families and our communities, how we're actually speaking about people's children, I think is something we really need to interrogate further as well. Yeah, it's a fascinating point. We may as well just stay with that for now, actually, because parents themselves, um, when they're raising their children, can have concerns about their play behaviours for, for whatever reason. And that kind of conversely, as much as practitioners, uh, particularly maybe rushing to assumptions on the part of the child, parents can do that too and bring those concerns to the, to the practitioners in the nursery setting. How, how might practitioners respond in, in, affirming, in an affirming way to parents who, who have concerns that perhaps may or may not be warranted um, with regards to neurodivergence in the early years? 
So I think this comes back to that concept of ableism and disableism and thinking about, first of all, your response and, and any of the kind of unconscious messages that might be coming through. So, for example, I had a really interesting conversation with a colleague the other day, actually, who's got an autistic child. And she said that when she has spoken with educators previously, there's a lot of kind of unspoken stuff around the fact that her autistic child is being judged as as less than. And it comes from if a parent comes in and they say, oh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about my child's development. I think they might be autistic. We as educators sometimes jump on that and I've done it myself where I've been like, no, don't worry, it's not that. You know, I myself as an autistic person have had that attitude of, no, don't worry, it's definitely not that. Maybe we should wait a bit longer. You know, they, they, they're just a boy. They might need more time. You know, we've all, we've all kind of engaged probably in those tropes that are underpinned by ableism. And actually, when I've had conversations with parents, what they often say is that their main priorities when they're speaking with educators is to, first of all, recognise that it takes a lot of vulnerability yourself as a parent to go to an educator and say, I am concerned, because you are revealing some of your own kind of vulnerabilities around that area. And they want to ensure that their child is then not going to be treated um discriminatory, I can't say that word, not going to be treated differently in a bad way as a result. Um, and so they want to, to be heard and they don't want to be invalidated. Something that I often notice with educators, and again, I've done it myself, where I have gone, oh, don't worry, like, let's give the child a bit more time. And sometimes you can not necessarily have the answer, but you can sit with the information and go, I hear what you're saying. I don't necessarily have an immediate response, but I've, I've, I'm holding space for what you've told me. And, I, and then we can start to think about what our next steps are. So I think holding space and um, trying to move away from that, don't worry. Actually, no, you are worried. You've come to me, so you've, you are already worrying. So I can, I can appreciate that you're concerned and that you're worried. Let's hold space for that and let's think about what our next steps are together. The other big thing for an educator as well is about themselves being able to be vulnerable. There's been situations where parents have come to me. And they've shared a concern or they've shared a diagnosis or they've shared something that's happening with their child. And I myself have been like, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And I've tried to perform like, oh, I'm the specialist. I know what I'm doing. Actually, sometimes going, do you know, this is new to me as well. As an educator, I've got a lot of knowledge and experience, but this situation is new. I've never done that referral before. or I've never gone through this process. Like I'm in it with you. And there's this, um, I forget the name of the, the author, but they wrote a book called Don't Get Upset. And one of the things that they wrote about in the book is that parents need to feel that we are by their side, particularly when it comes to developmental differences, because parents often describe that experience as being in a battle. And we don't want to be one of their kind of um, opponents. We want to be with them by their side because we know that they might have that journey. So, yeah, I think, again, that was a bit of a scrambled answer. But I think empathy, listening, holding space. Um, and really challenging your own perceptions and judgments of, of um, families, which I think, again, happens a lot. You know, you it might not be good enough for you or it might not be the way you would do it, but it's the way that family is doing it. And we need to, again, honour each family's funds of knowledge, um, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. It's that, it's that, almost that slow pedagogy again, isn't it? You know, taking mm -hmm. concerns seriously, but responding to them in a way that isn't hurried or rushed. And that feels like a really valuable space to end this episode. So thank you very much, Kerry. No worries. I would like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Kerry, for joining us and providing such valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Shadai Tembo and Kerry Murphy. If you've been inspired by our conversation today, don't forget you can sign up via the link in the episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content, including ideas for your settings and links to relevant resources.